Republican Lee Zeldin hopes to trade his perch in Washington for the executive mansion in Albany. The point starts right now. He's a three-term congressman and army veteran who's training his bazookas on Albany. Lee Zeldin is hoping to become the first Republican governor of New York since George Pataki. I know you don't have bazookas. But if you're elected, how will you avoid the gridlock um, of a Republican governor facing a legislature controlled by Democrats? Is that a recipe for dysfunction, or can you overcome that? Well, first off, as far as the exact makeup of the Senate and Assembly, it's up to the voters on November 8th, uh, where everyone is tuning in from. You have your local races for state Senate and state Assembly. But at the end of the day, when the people have spoken and a new government takes office in January, it's our job to work together to find common ground however possible. If there's a Democrat in the state legislature who disagrees with, with me on one particular topic, that doesn't mean we can't work together on the next. And some of these issues, they get called Republican versus Democrat. We shouldn't look at it like that. Look at the need to overhaul cashless bail, give judges discretion to weigh dangerousness. The mayor of the city of New York, he's a Democrat, but he believes that judges should have discretion. I agree. He says that we should amend, raise the age. He's right. Uh, so it's not just a Republican versus Democrat issue. We just have to work together to get the votes to get this stuff done. But Albany has proven itself to be very partisan. I mean, you know it, you were in, in Albany, you know it can be a very partisan place. Do you have some kind of secret sauce, some recipe for trying to get people to the table? I would say a few things. One is the, the voters, the will of the people, in very strong ways will be spoken on November 8th. When they are electing me as governor, they are also making a statement that they want to see Albany do more to fight crime. They're making a statement that they oppose congestion pricing and some of these other proposals of the direction they see in Albany that they're not happy with. So I think for the state legislature, they need to understand what our election on November 8th means, that they want balance restored to Albany, that they don't want it to be as partisan and as far left as it's gotten. Now, as far as next year, there's some leverage that you have with the budget process, the home rule messages, it's called, when the state legislators need the governor to sign off on some bill that's important for their district. There's also the power of the soapbox, the podium, uh, to be able to go into these districts to have press conferences and rallies and try to move public opinion to help set the agenda. At the end of the day, I want to be able to work with the legislature. Uh, but what they've indicated so far is on the most important issue of crime that I hear from so many New Yorkers, uh, the legislature's indicated that they don't want to change these laws. As a matter of fact, they want to go even further in passing more pro-criminal laws. So what that means is that the first day that I'm in office, I'm going to declare a crime emergency in New York. I'm going to suspend New York's cashless bail law and raise the age less is more, the HALT Act, and the discovery law changes. It's a suspension, and I'm going to bring the legislature to the table if they're not going to come on their own. But that only lasts for 30 days. And then there's the possibility that the legislature could try to overrule you. What will you do? Now, listen, I think it's really important for the legislature to understand what our election means. That this isn't about Republicans uh, all by themselves electing a new governor. No way. This is Republicans and Democrats and independents as New Yorkers uniting to say that Kathy Hochul is not doing a good job, that we need balance restored to Albany, that we need to fight crime. We saw it in the, the debate. Now, by the way, th this conversation, it should be a debate. You guys sent an invite. We, ex I, we accepted. I accepted. Uh, but you didn't get an acceptance from the governor. We did not. So we're not here on this couch together. So here we are. And I, I would just say, referencing the only debate that just took place a few days ago, that there, there were multiple questions about crime. And Kathy Hochul was missing out. The most important part of this is that you put handcuffs on criminals, not the criminal justice system. And when I was pointing this out, she says that she doesn't understand why that's so important to me. And when she says she doesn't understand why that's so important to me, that's a message to New Yorkers who care about this issue, that she doesn't understand why it's so important to them. She believes that we should just look away. There's nothing to see here. But for New Yorkers, this is real life. They want to see courage and leadership, and they're not getting it right now from Kathy Hochul. 
local. I guess I wonder that in addition to suspending these these laws, including bail reform and what you call the pro-criminal laws that Albany has passed, what is your public safety plan? How will you get the guns off the street? How will you stop people from doing things on the subway? Well, thank you for asking. And uh, last year, we rolled out our Secure Our Streets plan for New York on our website at zeldenfornewyork.com slash secureourstreets. We rolled out a couple dozen or so different proposals. And it's everything from some of what we've discussed right now. There's an attack right now on qualified immunity for law enforcement. I support qualified immunity for law enforcement. I believe that we should pass a law enforcement bill of rights. We should overhaul the parole board. There's so much more that can be done. Uh, if anyone wants to go read more, they could go to our website to read about it. And I'm confident that these dozens of different ideas that we've been promoting during the campaign, if, if you just did all of it, if we were to make any progress in even on day one doing some of it, it would be a big deal. You know, and then Kathy Hochul, two and a half weeks before an election, she did, rolls out uh, her plan, and it primarily had two items that were new for her. One was the idea that we should put more cops on the subways. The problem is she wasn't talking about hiring more NYPD, hiring more law enforcement, because that's what needs to happen. She's talking about mandatory forced overtime for people who are already getting stretched thin, getting pulled from one beat where they need to get uh, need to be to, to get to the subway. And the other piece is saying that we know where all the emotionally disturbed people are and that she's going to propose 50 beds. Would you increase that? Absolutely. Yeah, they, how many? Listen, we should be talking into the... If she's saying 50, I'm thinking 500 or 5,000. If, if there's a list... That, that they say that they know where everyone is. Whatever that list is, I'm sure that they're missing zeros so at the end of this big count. So do you have to reopen some of the psychiatric facilities that the state closed? Oh, you see with uh, six prisons were just closed down just a few months ago. And some of these prisons that get closed down, they're investing in the infrastructure of the, of the prison while they're closing it down. I was at Ogdensburg uh, up in the North Country. That was one of the prisons they were proposing. While I was there, two weeks before the last correctional officer and the last inmate was about to leave, they were still completing a multi-million dollar steam project. Why are you completing this steam project if you're saying that this is about to become an unused, abandoned building Would and you, you haven't decided... Would you open that up for, as a mental health institution? I think that there's a, a lot of infrastructure that is available, whether it's you talk in Ogdensburg or you're talking about one of these other facilities. But there are individuals on the street who need to be removed for their safety and for the safety of uh, other New Yorkers. They're being confrontational. Uh, New Yorkers are changing their behavior, their routine. They're walking through the streets with their head on a swivel. They're not riding the subway the way they used to, maybe not the same hours, maybe they take their yarmulke or turban off. People don't feel safe. To make them safe, you know, 50 EDPs coming off of the emotionally disturbed people coming off of the streets not going to solve it. So what about school safety officers? Are you talking about giving them guns? Well, listen, I don't want anyone to have a firearm who's not going to safely and securely carry a firearm for self-defense. Uh, there are people who work inside of schools who don't want a firearm, who wouldn't handle it safely. Should they have them, though? No, then, then absolutely not, as far as those people. No, but, but as far as people who are trained, who, who want to protect uh, a school or wherever it, it is, maybe they want to protect a synagogue, maybe they want to protect their business because they're targeted. See, here's the thing. There are law-abiding New Yorkers who want to safely and securely carry a firearm solely for self-defense, and there are criminals with illegal firearms committing crime after crime after crime, and they're still out on the streets. So I had a drive-by gang shooting at my house a few Sundays back. My 16-year-old girls were at the kitchen table doing homework on a quiet Sunday afternoon. Now, I don't know who the shooters were, I don't know what firearm they had, and I don't know what their motive was. But when Kathy Hochul, a few weeks back, put out a tweet saying that American Express, MasterCard, and Visa needs to flag all attempted purchases of firearms as suspicious. I guarantee you, whoever opened fire in my front yard a few weekends back didn't start that off with a swipe of an American Express card. So if you want to go after this problem, stop targeting the people in this group instead. So I want to just clarify, because there were stories that said that you would support giving uh, school safety officers guns and also uh, giving them bulletproof vests. Yeah, no, we uh, absolutely with whoever wants a bulletproof vest, they should have access to it. What about the gun? So anyone who is going to safely and securely carry that firearm and they are well trained and they're doing it to protect that site, 
Uh, that is that is very different than somebody who doesn't want to have a firearm there. I never so want to have a firearm in someone's officers, hand and they want it. So would you want school safety officers who want it to be trained to fire a gun? Uh, I think that's better than someone who is untrained and is unequipped. If you're talking about wanting to keep a school safe, I mean, I, I'm someone who's in favor of single point of entry. And now, that doesn't mean single point of exit. I'm talking single point of entry. And maybe if you have the manpower, you can have multiple points of entry at a particular time when all the kids are coming in. You can be smart about it. Part of this as well is having school resource officers. Part of this is also making sure that the school isn't a sanctuary where you're not communicating with local law enforcement. By the way, we're talking guns, but also knives, drugs. There's other crime that Should goes on inside of these guns? schools. Again, if you're talking about somebody who uh, doesn't want to have a firearm, I don't care you know, any variation of that question. I never want a firearm in the hands of someone who uh, does not want a firearm in their hand, who's not trained but for it. But if they're it. trained, do you think the teachers would, it's good to have a teacher with a gun in the school? N knowing the fact that the crimes that are being committed are not by concealed carry permit holders. And this, I pose this question, like when, when people are targeting the law-abiding New Yorker, when was the last time that there was a crime that was committed targeting the concealed carry permit holder. It's the person who has the illegal so firearm. So if yes you're a teacher, no? so if you're a teacher, and yes, if you're a teacher, and I've, this is a this isn't. An, I mean, I've been talking about this for years. Uh, if you're a teacher who wants to safely and securely carry the firearm, and you are trained, that that isn't a threat to students. That isn't a threat to other teachers. It's not a threat to the safety of the building. It improves the safety of the building. If there was someone who came into that building, you would be saying, thank God that teacher who was safely and securely carrying that firearm and was well trained was able to intervene and to save lives. And by the way, you know what? It probably wouldn't be as newsworthy because they'll be able to intervene quickly and there wouldn't be as big of a, a mass casualty event. There's a lot of stories uh, out there where uh, there would have been more victims, more, more uh, violence, more people hurt, if not for good people getting involved and intervening. So we'll have more with Lee Zeldin after the break. We're back talking to Republican gubernatorial candidate Lee Zeldin. I need to talk to you about President, the former President Trump. Would you consider granting clemency to Donald Trump and his family um, in the New York Attorney General's current civil suit if he were to be convicted? Uh, well, I've been asked this question before, and I said no. But the what we have to go further in with the way that the questions end up getting posed, and you, you're wording that question a little bit uh, uh, differently and, and in better faith. Uh, than some of the other ways I get asked. Uh, people are asking the question as if President Trump was convicted of something. Uh, so, you know, listen, I, I, I would say as far as going forward in the future with, with anybody out there, it's about fairness. Uh, it's not about politics. Uh, you have, it's, a, it's a pretty important power that a governor is given. And quite frankly, the clemency question, not specific to just one case, and that's the one that, of course, that, uh, that I've been asked about in the past and I've answered already. But with anybody, on the merit, it, it's something that needs to be used as a tool that's not viewed um, based on partisanship. It's just viewed on doing what's right to make sure that, the, that people have trust and faith in the system. And if you, don't make the, if you don't use that tool the right way, people lose trust and faith in the system. They lose trust and faith in the governor. So I need to ask you about congestion pricing because um, it's something that a lot of people are concerned about. I know you have said that you would stop it. But the question that I have is this, how will you pay for capital improvements to the MTA system on one side and then on the other side, although congestion pricing doesn't deal with that, um, how do you deal with the operating budget of the MTA, which is about $4 billion going forward? And is it possible to prevent a fare increase, which would come into effect Right, if you were to win right after you took election, you know, like after you won, after you went to Albany, it would come in effect like February, March, April, something like that. How do you, and, what do you do? And I totally oppose congestion pricing. Kathy Hochul supports congestion pricing. We should learn our lessons from London. We've seen some of the reports that have come out. So when you London's look at... London's actually backtracking. Yeah, because they ended up with certain parts of London ending up with more congestion. 
And the estimates that have come out say more truck traffic on Cross Bronx Expressway, more truck traffic on so the Staten Island Expressway. How do you Expressway, fund the MTA? More, um, more cars through Queens and Brooklyn trying to get other routes. So now the estimate is not accurate of what the MTA is going to raise off of this because you know that they're going to be passing I'm out exemptions. They're going to be passing out exemptions like candy. We're watching the process even start to play out. So first off, that number is not real. Secondly, here's the, here's the top two ways right off the bat. If you want more people riding public transportation, don't try to punish them. Already suffering from gas and taxes, uh, gases and, and tolls and, and parking. Instead, improve the ridership experience. Make it safer. There, if you have two million more people riding the subway every day and they're paying their fare, that's a lot more money for the MTA. Also, you need to enforce fare jumping. We're also talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. A few years back, the number was almost zero. It was about 3%. I saw one estimate from 2018. Now it's up in the double digits. People riding but not actually paying their fare. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Alvin Bragg came in on, on day one. Part of his day one memo, he says he wasn't going to enforce fare jumping at all. So if you were to look at what is going to be... Can you get enough money from all of this to prevent a fare hike? Uh, well, there's other ways to save money, too. And I'll say a couple things. One is the MTA chairman... Uh, and this, uh, I'll say chairmen, because this is something that's been an issue now through multiple administrations. They put their hand out to the federal government. They say, federal government, if you give me billions of dollars, I promise you all of your wildest dreams will come true and we'll never ask for any more money ever again. And they get the billions of dollars. You know what they do the next day? They say, okay, federal government, I really mean it this time. If you give me billions of dollars, all of your wildest dreams will come true. I'll never ask for any more money again. It's a money pit. Um, I would also say when you look at vendor and consultant contracts, um, just, there are other ways to be able to save money to make the MTA operate more efficient. I'm just pointing out two of the most important ways to help generate revenue to offset their inaccurate estimation of how much will be raised from congestion pricing is making it a safer experience, a better ridership experience, and enforcing fare jumping. But that's not it. There are other items, as I mentioned, uh, with some of these contracts as well. Uh, you look at their capital portfolio with all their capital assets. Uh, and I just think that they need to change the mindset where they can't just not worry about balancing their budget correctly and just hoping, praying, and then actually getting bailout after bailout from the federal government. So we only have a, about a couple minutes left, but I want to talk to you about your tax club plan. You have promised to cut the biggest tax cut in the history of the state. I'm wondering if you've thought about what specific taxes you would like to cut. Uh, I don't think that we should have an estate tax in New York. Um, I believe that we should cut the income tax rate across the board. Uh, we have New Yorkers of all walks of life who are deciding to leave some. Uh, young kids, they're having their first family. They can either have their, they, they're putting their family together. Their first kid can be in the basement of mom and dad's house or they can uh, go buy their own home maybe down in North Carolina. Seniors spent their whole lives in New York, but they're on a fixed income. They're struggling to afford to survive here. They're deciding to leave. By the way, there's also wealthy people who you Would could you continue the millionaire's tax? Uh, I, I, this is exactly why it's a bad idea. Um, you have wealthy people who can afford to pay more. That's not in doubt. And you could say, well, we want them to pay their fair share. Okay, so let's just say you keep raising their taxes. You know what's happening? It's happening all the time. They pick up the phone, they call their accountant, they call their attorney, and then they leave the state. They're more mobile than ever. So they go down to Florida, and now they're not paying any income taxes up there, down there, they're not paying any income taxes up here. So this isn't about what you think is the right amount for that person to be paying on top of what they're already pay, paying. The reality is, is that if you keep raising taxes on New Yorkers, they're hitting their breaking point. They're saying, you know what? I'm gone. You don't want me to live here. But Kathy Hochul said that I am, I'm challenging her as governor, and, and she says that I'm no longer a New Yorker. She demands I get on a bus and I move to Florida. And it's a message to a lot of people who are out there who are just not happy with the direction of the state. Uh, so I just, I feel like there are a lot of New Yorkers of all walks of life who are getting pushed away on economic policies and public safety policies and more. So we're going to have to leave it right there, but I can tell you that the conversation with a man who wants to be the next governor of New York continues right after our show on our streaming network, CBS News New York. We'll be right back.